support network that you're in, that made the difference for me. I don't feed the homeless. I go out and I fellowship with my unhoused family. That's what I love about cookbooks. You have to read between the lines. Today on Spotlight, those making the world a better place with food. Meet a woman uplifting the community one meal at a time. And an app cooking up support for African-American-owned restaurants in town. Also, a bakery restoring hope while baking sweet treats. But first, a book that explores the historic contributions of African-American chefs. It's Sunday, and you're watching Spotlight. To think of African-American cooking as simply a modern-day version of soul food is to think of a gumbo as simply a soup. Even while under slavery, black cooks created a distinctly American food way, one that blends Southern cooking with European and Native American influences. Their talents earned them the respect of slave owners and employers, and that impact is felt still today. A book by Washington University professor Rafia Zafar examines the historic contributions of black chefs. Recipes for Respect is not a cookbook. Instead, it's an examination of the intersection of African American culture, history, and food. It notes that she was awarded two medals for best pickles and sauces and best... To Dr. Zafar, cookbooks are a form of literature. In them, she finds revelations about African American history, especially when the author is a former slave. For example, an orientation clause, the sentence that explains a recipe, reveals a lot about a cook's life beyond the kitchen. I concluded to bring forward a book of my knowledge based on an experience of upwards of 35 years in the art of cooking. That's what I love about cookbooks. You have to read between the lines. Although Dr. Safar's book is academic, she is a professor after all, it's peppered with characters who jump off the page. Many of the chefs she writes about were former slaves, like Abby Fisher, whose book, What Mrs. Fisher Knows About Old Southern Cooking, was published in 1881. Abby Fisher was from the Deep South, ended up in San Francisco, where she's listed in directories as a, a pickle maker and a caterer. And she became well known for her expertise and deliciousness of the things she made. And she had a group of well-off uh, white San Francisco women who encouraged her to write a cookbook. There's no mention of her background. There's no mention of her race, only that she is someone who, she says in the introduction, that she did not have the benefit of an education. And then there are only three recipes that either glancingly or about as explicitly as you can get refer to a life spent, if not literally in slavery in a slave society. One for uh, blackberry syrup, one for hoe cakes, and one for what she calls infant pap. Take one pint of flour, sift it and tie it up in a clean cloth securely tight. And, and it's actually an incredible thing for a black woman in the South to say. Particularly if it was in slavery, that meant she wasn't separated from her children. And there is Melinda Russell, whose 1866 pamphlet of recipes is the earliest known cookbook by an African American. When you read her, her cookbook, she has a slave narrative, you know, the story of her family prefacing her cookbook. I was born in Washington County and raised in Greene County in the eastern part of Tennessee. My mother was a member of one of the first families set free by Mr. Noddy of Virginia. Essentially saying, we were slaves, um, and this is a good cookbook, because even by that point, the idea that there were black people who were in the kitchen and were sophisticated cooks, great cooks, was already starting to take hold of the American consciousness. Former slave Rufus Estes was heralded for his fine cooking, enjoyed by royalty and heads of state on luxury Pullman cars. His cookbook was published in 1911, 
and includes an entire chapter on sauces. And with instructions that could be lifted from Downton Abbey, Butler Robert Roberts' 1827 book was a guide to proper hospitality in a well-to-do household. When your cloth is perfectly even, then put round your plates, laying four at each side. Then put round your knives and forks, placing your knives at the right hand with the edge of the blade toward the... He tells you how to polish silver, certain remedies like for hangover, but also just how to run a household correctly. Where does this interest in food intersect with academia? Dr. Safar says food became a fascination in childhood during time spent in her grandmother's Harlem kitchen. The thing I'm kind of interested in in terms of literature is not n only the way a sentence or a story is put together, but the cultural and the historical context. I saw how much what anthropologists call food ways, how much that has to do with the creation of black literature and how black authors specifically use their knowledge of food ways um, to sort of construct a black literary or entrepreneurial uh, civil rights identity. Follow HEC Media on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. These pots are banging for a very good reason. We bang revolutionary pots. The revolution is love, and love always wins. Meet Mama Cat, activist and pot banger from way back. My mother was a cook. I lived in a tenement in the Bronx. I could look up at the window, and the windows were fogged up. And when you go inside the door, you can hear them pots banging and clanging. So I said, I want to be a pot banger when I was a kid, specifically for the family. And that is just what she has become. Today, Mama Cat and her team of volunteers feed the hungry on the streets of St. Louis. Pot Bangers is a registered 501c3. We are a nonprofit organization. We provide care, comfort, and nourishment. We cook 150 meals each Thursday. We aid families that don't have enough to make it through. We partner with a lot of different awesome community groups and that help get people off the street into housing. So, you know, we try to fill in gaps. That's our role in life is to fill in gaps. It all began during the Ferguson Uprising. I met Mama Cat during the Ferguson Uprising because she showed up after a really rough night when police had been um, tear gassing people and it was three o'clock in the morning and everything else was closed and people were hungry. And she showed up and she popped open her trunk and she had like a full tray of fish and a full tray of chicken. And I think she's just a really incredible person who like inspires community and brings people together um, as part of building something a lot bigger than one person. Mama Cat believes that food is love. You know, when you break bread, you break down walls. If they have a, a chance to talk, everybody has a story. And it's quite amazing. We have to remember that these are our mothers and fathers, our brothers and sisters, these are our children. I don't feed the homeless. I go out and I fellowship with my unhoused family. I want them to know that we love them. When I go out on the street, I get hugs, I get love. And you know what, that do more for me probably than it do for them. Of course, she could not do this alone. I have a crew that come from every walk of life, every background. You got black, white, brown, you got straight, gay, and trans. You see Corrine down there, she's 82 years old, and then we have the young ones. They are the spirit. In the face of lots of hostilities that the unhoused people face, like we can do something to show a little bit of kindness. For Mama Cat, her own history is a big part of why she does what she does. Back in 1989, I was in San Diego, California, and I had three children. I had one situation and we ended up homeless. And I know what it's like to, for people to look over you like you don't matter, like you don't belong. When you are one who have the least among everybody, people tend to overlook your humanity. And I said, if I ever got in a position where I can be a help, that's what I'm going to do. You don't have to have a lot to make a difference in somebody's life. For me to know somebody had a full belly, 
that's a joyful moment for me. If they don't have a place to lay their head and I can be that difference that get them on their road to being housed, that's wonderful. So I have so many, I'm so grateful for so much. Boundless energy and her affection for humanity is what keeps Mama Cat doing what she does. When we can say that we help people find their way back to homes when they're not hungry, once we done all that, we can say mission accomplished. Celebrating Black History Month and those making the world a better place with food. I enjoy cooking, I always like creating new things. Chef Lawrence Andrew Reynolds has his own ideas about preparing food for his customers. Seafood grits is one of my creations that contains shrimp, lobster, and crab meat. It's a pleasure for him to create. Lobster Rockefeller. And when it comes to his dishes, he's not shy. We have the best crab cakes in St. Louis. There's no fillers, no breading, no peppers, no anything, just jumbo lump crab meat with seasoning and a house-made uh, Cajun rumelade that we do. He's co-owner of Oasis Grill in a predominantly black St. Louis neighborhood. It's a community that's at the heart of his business partner's vision. He's from Jenny's, grew up, uh, went to, graduated from Jenny's High School. Uh, he's always lived in the neighborhood. His mother lives in the neighborhood. He likes the finer things in life. Opening its doors in 2019, Oasis Grill wanted to bring fine foods into the Jennings community so that people who live and work here don't have to go far for the experience. So like little kids, when they eat, they'll be humming or singing or something. That's how you should feel when you eat. Oasis Grill is one of many Black-owned restaurants in the St. Louis area featured on a website and an app called For the Culture STL. Ohan Ashe is the creator. I was heavily active in the Ferguson protest and the Jason Stockley protest, organizing to media, to making the flyers. Once those started dying down a little bit, I had this desire to uplift Black-owned businesses. She wanted to provide one place that will link people to Black-owned businesses where they live or visit, and it has links for online shopping. We have been seen in every single state. We have been seen in all seven continents. And you have to think that this is specifically for a small demographic of black people in St. Louis, yet the world uses this website. And for black folks, we haven't really had something that was just for us that people could support. And from the people who use her site, she discovered their passion is food. The food category is the most popular uh, category out of all of them. It's growing to the point that restaurants are reaching out to Ohan, asking for their information to be added. JoJo's Fish and Chicken on Dr. Martin Luther King Drive is one of them. I saw what she was doing. I thought it was an excellent idea. With so many varieties of food and providing a new way for people to find what they enjoy, Ohan wants to expand into other cities, other states, so that we can have a For the Culture Chicago, For the Culture Kansas City. It's a need. People want to utilize a business that is, is a different race and ethnicity. We need something like For the Culture where it's a lot of young businesses and more established businesses. I think it's great to have a directory and something that's easily shareable. People who may not even know about us, if they subscribe to for the culture or they support it, they'll see us in there. Hopefully they'll get interested in what we offer and come pay us a visit. HEC Media presents Talking With Authors, the podcast. Your favorite writers and genres with diverse subjects and styles like Jenna Fisher with The Actor's Life, A Survival Guide. The book is literally about my journey from St. Louis to Hollywood. With new podcasts dropping bi-weekly, Subscribe to Talking with Authors. My name is Daryl Pitchford. My nicknames are Big Dog and OG. The guys like to call me that from time to time. Original gangster. That's a term of respect in the hood. I never thought I'd be a baker. Never. It's funny how things happen, you know. I don't know if I would get as much gratification from another career as I do from this one. The feeling of 
you know, being able to take a little flour and a little water and a little butter and make something magnificent. I think there's a therapeutic aspect to it. I know how I feel when, when, when I'm baking, uh, you know, a certain level of exuberance. I work with a group of young guys. Uh, I'm able to help them just to kind of be a role model and just to let them know that you can do it. Amazing, man. Two months yeah. ago, he didn't know none of this. Yeah, this is the only job I've actually liked. Now you're a pro. In most cases, they need help. They need guidance. They can benefit from my experience, my life experience. They will listen to me. It's because they know I've been there. I was married in Chicago. In 10, we got divorced. She got the house. My children are here in St. Louis. I talked to my son. He says, oh, don't worry about it, Pop. Come on down here and stay with us. And then uh, he ended up losing his house. And so we had to hit the streets. And uh, that's when my, my journey began. Here I am, 57 years old, and I'm on the street, you know. And uh, it, was, it was quite an experience, to say the least, okay? It's quite an experience. So I started breaking in the garage at night. I was standing in somebody's garage, and uh, I almost froze to death in that garage. And, and so, That was the worst. Yeah, that was the worst. I woke up and half my body was frostbitten. Well, that was the first time that I actually got afraid. On the street, I, I didn't, I was never afraid. That was the first time I was afraid. I've always been willing to work. How do you get a job if you don't have a mailbox or an address or a, uh, a bed to sleep in at night? It's kind of difficult. People feel like they're being rejected and, and people are being rejected, not just feeling like it. They feel that way because they are being rejected. So yeah, you lose hope and I think that's what kills you. Because once you lose hope, it's, you can dig a hole and climb in. It's over. I don't feel like it would have happened without Bridge Grit. And not just the job, because the job is one thing, but the support, the support network that you're in when you're with Bridge Grit, that made the difference for me. Being a bridge bread baker, we're willing to kind of understand that there's still some chaos in their lives. So that when there's a stumble, it's not over, you know, and we'll, and we'll work with them. So the transformational process is, I accept you the way you are. I'm not gonna try to find a, a way to fire you. I'm not gonna try to find a way to hurt you. I'm not gonna try to take anything away. Instead, we're gonna hold you up when you fall down a little bit, but you're gonna have to be putting the energy into it and when you do, it'll be your success. They meet you where you are. And I think that makes a, a lot of difference. You know, if I have a drinking problem, you have to help me address that. If I have a drug problem, then you have to help me address that. And if you don't, you're not really helping me. They start making bread or cinnamon rolls. And people are dying for them. And you look at the cinnamon rolls, you go, I made that. I can do something good. I can succeed. I can hope again. And that's what we do for them. We give them the ability to hope. I know it's a wonderful program because it has helped me and I know others who the program has helped. 
people have come come here and worked for a while and moved on to other things, you know, uh, other jobs, other careers. It's amazing to hear guys talk about 401k programs, you know, and a year ago they didn't have a bank account. You know, that's the kind of growth I think you want to see from a program like this. If you can help somebody get to the next phase whatever that is for them in their life or the next level, I think that's that's key. Well, I'm trying to show them that, you know, just find you a little job and, and work it consistently, be true to it, and you can get your life back in, in order. You know, and I'm living proof of that. I'm in a good place in my life right now, and, and, and I'm happy. Loving life. Living the dream, as they say. now. From photography to paintings, the new spring exhibits are on display at the Contemporary Art Museum. Or enjoy art about heaven, earth, purgatory, or paradise at Art St. Louis. It's free, open Monday through Saturday. See more on these stories at hecmedia.org. And did you know local libraries are dropping overdue fines? Here's more. It's a cause for celebration. Past due fines are a thing of the past. At St. Louis County and Public Libraries. Studies show feeling guilty about fines can prevent people from using libraries altogether. Dropping library fines has become a trend across the country. City, all past due fines will be forgiven. In the county, patrons will need to pay off 2019 fines. Happy reading! On stage this week in St. Louis, the New Jewish Theater has a story of a young painter torn between upbringing and artistic desire. My name is Asher Lev. Upstream Theater mounts the English language debut of a French Canadian family drama and black comedy, Wildfire. Myriad Productions is putting on the 1979 Pulitzer Prize award-winning Sam Shepard play, Buried Child. Shakespeare Festival St. Louis shows a hip-hop version of a classic in Dress the Park. Reviews for these shows and more at hecmedia.org. HEC Media, supporting and promoting the arts. Check out our features and shows on theater, dance, music, the visual arts, and more. Find this and all our award-winning content at hecmedia.org. At Pete's SureSave in University City, the groceries are cheap, but the entertainment is free. And now, ladies and gentlemen, he Mark. Let someone start believing in you. Let For the past time. several years, Mark Richmond has been putting food on his table by singing in St. Louis supermarkets. I used to sing downtown at Schnucks. Hey, keeps the lights on. Mark sings live to recorded music. He's got 150 toe-tapping arrangements he can call up with just a tap of his finger. A little town blue. They are mostly old favorites made famous by old favorites like Dean Martin, Bobby Darin, Tony Bennett, and of course, Frank Sinatra. I'm not an impersonator. A lot of people say, hey, you sound just like Sinatra. Personally, I don't think so. I have his phrasing down absolutely 100%. But the voice, if you think I sound like Sinatra, that's fine. For Frank Sinatra, she'd holler and stamp. That's why the lady is a tramp. These days, Mark mostly plays the big room at Pete's. Check out how he works the checkouts. 
girl to call my own. I want to dream that so I don't have to So how did Mark become the headliner at Pete's? Well, take a singer looking for work and a small store looking to stand out from the big boxes, and then... What would happen? I was at a restaurant one evening and Mark was singing there, and on his break he came over and talked with us. They asked me where I was singing. I said, an occasional grocery store. This guy says, wait a minute, I own a grocery store. Come on over here and let's talk. The next week I was there. I find it all so amusing. Sale items are still the names on the marquee at Pete's. Mark's appearances are simply noted by a flyer on the door and limited to major holidays. This was his 4th of July show. No stage or dressing room required. I get this much dressed at home and then I come in here, put on the jacket, and we're ready to rock and roll. I'm no good without you. Mark's wardrobe also includes a pair of cufflinks. He says once belonged to Frank Sinatra, who stole them from Sammy Davis. There's an aura about them, like Superman's cape. I have the cufflinks. Mark starts every show with a recorded right introduction, now. performed by his friend, the late Ed McMahon. Mark. She Singing in a grocery store has its drawbacks. After all, if you bomb, there are lots of tomatoes available for throwing. And it can be a little noisy. Doesn't bother me at all. You just live with it. And I mean, I might be in, a song, in the middle of a song and I'll yell out, liquid cleanup, aisle four. You feel part of every mountain, sea, and shore. Well, he always sounds good. I've heard it before. It's my biggest fan. It's very I love his singing. He'll give me a rhythm to work with. I love it. Won't come here to Pete's just saying. In ermine and pearls. Vegas, it is not. It's not even Branson. But at least when you play at Pete's, you are always guaranteed a standing ovation. Thank you, ladies. That's a wonderful thing to see, my friend. I don't make a whole lot of money doing this, but I love what I do more than most people love what they do. That's why the lady, that is why the lady. I wouldn't trade it for the world. for watching Spotlight. Join us again next Sunday at 9.30 a.m.